Welcome and thank you for joining our Beach Reads Bash. Today's event is a collaboration between A Mighty Blaze and the Newburyport Literary Festival. I'm Jennifer Entwistle and I'm the co-director of the Newburyport Lit Fest. So before COVID, we host an in-person festival in Newburyport, Massachusetts on the last weekend of April every year. Uh, but obviously this year our plans had to change. So while we look forward to gathering together in person again to celebrate reading sometime in the future. Um, we're really pleased that we're able to, to collaborate with the Mighty Blaze to bring you online events. So before we begin, I just wanna mention a few housekeeping items. Um, as you probably can tell, we are using Zoom and it's the webinar version, which means that um, you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear the audience. So there is a chat mechanism that you can use if you need to uh, get our attention, but also feel free to use that to have conversations, to call out anything, uh, make any comments that you'd like. Um, there is also, oh, see, somebody's already using it. So hello from New Jersey there. Um, there's also at the bottom of your Zoom screen is a Q&A button. So when you have uh, thought of a question for the panel, we'll be doing Q&A at the end of the session. Please enter your question using that button so that we can have a list of questions and use that for the formal uh, Q&A at the end. Um, I'd also like to ask that if you're thinking of buying books uh, that we talk about today, that you please do so from an independent bookseller. Um, they need our support now more than ever. Um, we have a partner bookshop called the Bookshop of Beverly Farms, and I will put the, a link to the, the page that they have set up on bookshop.org um, over in the chat, so you'll be able to connect to them. So now let's get started. We're here for the Changing Tides panel. And I wanna introduce your moderator today. It's Jenna Payone from A Mighty Blaze. Jenna's an author, songwriter, and Cape Cotter, currently at work on her first novel. She's also the media and special events producer and on-air host for A Mighty Blaze, an all-volunteer team of writers founded by Jenna Blum and Caroline Levitt founded to help other writers who are publishing during the time of COVID. Jenna, over to you. Thanks, Jen. Sorry about that, that wonky sentence there in my, my hastily scribbled bio. But it's so great to see you all today. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so thrilled to be hosting you all today um, on this Changing Tides panel, which as you all know who are joining us is a historical fiction themed panel where we're going to be talking a lot about the past and summer's past and that amazing nostalgia thing that happens in the summer that we're all so familiar with. Um, I could not be more thrilled to have the authors joining us who are joining us today. We have the incredible Sarah Blake, whose book is The Guest House and it's out in paperback now. We have the incredible Brooklyn Foster, whose Summer Darlings is, is out now. Um, it just came out, right, in June? Uh, uh, no, mine's May. May, May. Yes, yours just came out in May. And then we have the amazing Susie Ormond Schnall, whose We Came Here to Shine just came out recently as well. Um, so ladies, welcome. Do you want to say hi, a quick hi? Hi, you guys. Hi, everybody. And so, yes, if you have any questions for our authors, please enter them into the chat. Um, and I mean, sorry, not into the chat, into the ask a question box. And I'll do my best to keep up and also monitor the questions. But for now, I'm going to let each of the authors introduce their own books. Um, their bios are all being pasted into the chat so you can go and read about their incredible accomplishments. But we thought we'd get right into the books, which is the good stuff. So why don't we start with you, Sarah, and we'll go in alphabetical order and you can tell us a little bit about the guest house. Okay. I mean, sorry, the guest book, the guest okay. book. <laughs> okay, because actually it is a, a kind of key distinction. Uh, I know it is a key distinction. I've read your book and I know it's very important that it is the guest book. <laughs> Thank you, though, so much, Jenna. And thanks, Jen, and I mean, all of you. And um, I'm so psyched to hear Susie and Brooke. And um, I mean, one of the great things about festivals, as all of you know, is just gathering all of us. And, um, and especially, especially, though I can't see you 32 people um, who are out there, I'm just, I'm so always so happy to be um, talking to readers. And in this case, to be sort of at least gathering halfway with readers. So 
Thank you for having me. So this is the paperback of the guest book. Um, it came out in May in, in paper. And the guest book is a um, big, juicy family saga. It traces the Milton family, which is an old money family that's run out of its money, but not its sense of place, um, or more importantly, its place, which is an island off the coast of Maine that the um, the patriarchs uh, bought in 1935, and they became the Miltons of Crockett's Island. The novel moves back and forth in time, literally um, scene to scene from 1935-36 to 1959, where the second generation, it, where their sort of knot is untangled. Um, there are three uh, children in that generation, Joan, Moss, and Eve, Evie, and their friends, Len and Reg. And then the third generation in the present, which is Evie, who is Evie Milton and her husband, Paul. Um, it moves back and forth in time as you trace the consequences through those generations of a single event that took place in 1936 um, that was passed down in silence. Um, and, and it really looks at the ways in which family memory um, creates the sort of uh, mythos around the family and about what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget. And it's very much centering about race and class and um, a sense of the history inside us. Thank you, Sarah. Let's, let's, we're going to get back to that you <laughs> said in a little bit because it's very important. <laughs> um, let's let's uh, move along to Brooke, please. Can you tell yes. us about Summer Diary? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And Sarah, your cover last summer was the cover, you know, of the summer for me. I picked up your book immediately and read it because I, oh. I that's based on the cover alone. I just loved it. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah. And Susie, I just finished your book, you know, and loved it too. So I'm so excited to be with these women. But Summer Darlings, um, my novel, my debut novel, takes place in 1962 in Martha's Vineyard, and it follows college student Hetty Winsome. She's a poor scholarship student from Brooklyn, and she gets a job nannying for a wealthy family on Martha's Vineyard, and um, the summer is just not what she, you know, thinks it's going to be. She starts the summer thinking this family is very glamorous, they might as well be the Kennedys, but as she goes through the summer, no one on the island is who they seem. There's a starlet next door, the surfer down the beach, and the waspy socialite she's working for. Um, she kind of peels back the curtain and gets a sense of, of um, what everyone's really up to, and it's not who, they, who she thinks they're going to be. So. It never is, is no. it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to, thank you so much, Brooke. Let's go on to Susie, um, and you can tell us about We Came Here to Shine. Um, I definitely want to ditto what Sarah and Brooke have both said. It is so wonderful to be here with everybody out there. And um, Jenna and Jen, thank you so much for having me and for organizing. And um, to reiterate what Sarah said, it, one of the best things about these panels and festivals is meeting other authors. And um, I already know Brooke, and it's so nice now to know Sarah. So um, thank you for having me. So we came here to shine is uplifting historical fiction set at the 1939 New York World's Fair. Mm -hmm. And it uh, follows two young women who um, find themselves working at the fair for the summer, which is the last place that either of them wants to be, and about the obstacles that they both encounter as they try to pursue their personal and professional dreams. So we have, uh, the first main character is Vivi, and she is a Hollywood starlet who is just in the first chapter starting her first starring role in a Hollywood picture. And the studio head plucks her out, ships her off to New York, where she is to star in the Aquacade, which is a synchronized swimming spectacular and was the highest grossing attraction at the 1939 New York World's Fair. Wow. The other main character is Max. Max is a journalism student at NYU and wants nothing more than for her summer internship placement to be at the New York Times where she can write real news. But instead, her professor assigns her to Today at the Fair, which was the Daily Fair newspaper. So you have these two women who are in the last place that they thought they would be. Um, and it ends up being uh, the summer that they would never forget. So it's a story about friendship and women's ambition, and it's all set against the really extraordinary and iconic New York World's Fair of 1939. So great. Oh my gosh, all of your books. I just like, I'm obsessed with all of that. 
<laughs> they're just all so perfect in their unique ways. And uh, let's let's dive right into the good stuff, which is uh, for me, anytime I see, you know, sweeping historical epic or, you know, set against the backdrop of the glamorous, then I'm like, okay, what era are we in? And I, and there's a few eras that really like my personal interest with historical fiction is 1900s and beyond. And clearly all of you are writing in that world. Um, what about the particular era that you're writing about drew you to this story? Did the era, did the sort of the thirties come first, Susie, or the, the characters? And then you were like, oh, well, this should take place in the thirties. Um, we'll start with you because you, you went last, last time. Um, and then Sarah, I'm going to adjust the question a little bit for you because you span like a hundred years in your book. <laughs> so, so Susie, why don't you take it away? The, the idea for the story came first and then, um, then came my interest in 1939. And it all started with this book, which is Esther Williams autobiography called The Million Dollar Mermaid. And I was reading this book and just loved it. Esther Williams was incredibly ambitious and outspoken. And she talks about the summer of 1940 when she swam in the Billy Rose Aquacade at the Golden Gate Exposition, which was the San Francisco World Fair, 1940. And I got to that part and I thought, Aquacade? What's an Aquacade? I'd never seen that word before. So I went to Google, looked up the Aquacade, and suddenly found myself deep in a rabbit hole of learning all about this incredible multi-million dollar production um, and, and its relationship to the 1939 World's Fair. It actually debuted in 1937 in Cleveland, Ohio at that uh, exposition, but it, it really took on prominence in 1939. Um, and so that just, that became the story that I wanted to talk about. I really wanted to place a character in the Aquacade at the World's Fair and bring the reader um, into that world to show them the history and the background and what was really going on. So and especially the story of women, because a lot of the pictures of the World's Fair, including the groundbreaking, groundbreaking ceremony, the dedication ceremony where um, President Roosevelt was the speaker, all you see is is white men in the background. And so I really wanted, I'm always curious, you know, what are the women thinking? So that's where it came from. That's so great. That's so interesting. And we're going to get to character in a second because I want to talk specifically about the characters. Uh, Brooke, how about you? Because you have a connection to Martha's Vineyard, right? Yes, I've been going to Martha's Vineyard for many summers. Um, but my, my book takes place in 1962. And when I was trying, you know, the, the book was inspired about a specific set of houses on Martha's Vineyard, which we can get into later, that were there in the 1950s and had some really interesting characters living in them, real people living in them. But why 1962? I mean, my, my parents were hippies and they really mythologized the late 60s, you know, to me and my siblings growing up. But I was just always really interested in the times right before that, you know? It, it, Six months after Hetty leaves, my main character leaves Martha's Vineyard, um, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique is published. You know, uh, in November in 1963, about a little over a year later, Kennedy's shot. So the whole world is about to change, but my characters are living in this bubble, this perfect summer, you know, where they have no idea what's about to come, which is really relevant to today because that's how we all feel about COVID, right? We all remember what our lives were like before this happened. And so back, you know, I chose 1962 specifically for that. And also because Marilyn Monroe dies in the, <laughs> in the middle of that summer and it just provided a great arc for the story. But women's roles were really, you know, women were housewives and it was very glamorized and they were told that they should be very happy with their roles and they really weren't. But they were all still smiling and they really looked fabulous. and. I just found that really interesting to mine. So, so that's why I chose that, that time period. Gosh, that's so great. I want to hear all about everything <laughs> to do with that. I want to hear about these people in these houses now. And I can't wait to go to Martha's Vineyard and like look at the houses when it's safe to go again <laughs> and be like, I know something about the people that live there now. <laughs> all right, now, Sarah, for you, when you tackle a book, like your book is, I, I can't even wrap my head around the research you must have had to do for this book, but were you thinking, I want to write about this family and I want to write th about them in a specific time? Or were you thinking, I need to tell the whole story? Because the story of the family really is the story of this American journey of, you know, from the way these ruling class families used to operate into a totally different thing. And we're still 
we're still living that out. But did you, did yeah. you kind of, did you know that you were going to take on, I'm going to take on the American story <laughs> from 1900 and beyond, or did that happen naturally? No, I mean, I think one of the great things listening to Susie and Brooke is that what you hear are, you know, writers who are like, well, what's this about? You know, like, 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 what's this house or what's this time period? Or, I mean, I think that's uh, when you guys all agree, like, that's the great thing about being writers. We get to like make stuff up to try and find that out. You know, it's just like, it's the, you know, our, our books are our laboratories. So I didn't at all. I never, my novels never start off. I never think I'm going to do what I end up doing. I knew I wanted to write a big, juicy family saga because I love those. And mm -hmm. especially, you know, I have a doctorate in Victorian literature. So like my whole thinking about is like interwoven stories, things that take a long time to, you know, develop and unravel. But, oops, sorry, that's my, um, but um, the thing like uh, Brooke, I'm really sorry. That's okay. This is actually great. This is the best, these are the best parts. It's like, it, I mean, this is, this is, you know, panels in the time of COVID. We have fun. Right. <laughs> but, but like Brooke, um, I also, I'm most interested in the moments, you know, before the historical moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I started this book wanting to think about 1959. And, and for many of the same reasons that Brooke outlined, um, I wanted to think about the American um, century before it exploded, you know, the civil rights, um, women's rights, the, the pill. In 1959, everything was right below the surface. Everything was incipient that was going to then explode onto the surface um, in the 60s. So I wanted to think about, again, the sort of bubble, especially because I did want to pay attention to this wasp family, this old money family, and the ways in which, you know, um, secrets get passed on, but also how they get told. And, and so much got cracked open in the 60s in this country, and then, you know, cracked open that continues to, to grow now. So um, my, so then, you know, the 30s also, and I knew that I had to actually um, show the sort of bedrock of the 50s. Again, I wanted to set it um, before, you know, before Kristallnacht, before everything became overt. Um, my, the, uh, the matriarch and patriarch of the Miltons both uh, have a kind of, they, they don't think that they're anti-Semitic. In fact, um, Ogden Milton, who is, uh, who invests in Nazi steel, thinks he is doing that in order to preserve the kind of um, order. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that kind of, um, you know, implication, but that is completely deniable, I was interested in. So again, much as what you guys are all saying, like, looking at what we what what we don't see the sort of history with a capital h what does it look like off the you know just around the side of the photograph on the edges of the photograph in the years that don't make you know the big mark so great oh my gosh so now we've got we've got the settings right now we're, we're planted in history we need to populate these these worlds, these rich worlds. And I feel like you have all done such an amazing job of picking the perfect character, characters, you know, primary characters to, to tell this story through that are like totally emblematic of their, their time in history, but also perfectly positioned to bump up against you know, against the restrictions, the limitations of their time. You, you know, these are things I'm all I'm hearing from all of you. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about developing, especially your your primary protagonists. But like, which you know, did you think about like, well, I really need, um, you know, I, I need this to be a young co-ed. I need this to be a young woman who is going through this journey. And where since I I said that, Brooke, we're going to start with you um, and and put you in the hot seat this time. But how did you kind of go about? you know, um, do you, sorry, do you pronounce it Hetty or Hedy? Hetty. Hetty, yeah. I, I usually say Hetty yeah. too, just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, how did you go about designing Hetty? So I knew that, you know, when I started writing, I feel like this is true with a lot of um, first time novelists. I wrote my secondary character so much um, better than I wrote my main character because I was the fly on the wall and I was just kind of watching the secondary characters, and I was so amazed by them. And then I went back and I thought, wow, this, um, my main protagonist, nobody even knows who she is. So then in order for it to really work, I mean, I knew she was always going to be a scholarship student. I knew she was going to be poor. I knew she was going to be struggling. I knew she was going to lose her scholarship in the first chapter of the book. 
because it gave her a reason to really want to fit into these mm -hmm. you know, wealthy circles. And she starts, she goes to the island believing because she never had money that money really can buy happiness. So she thinks that as she meets these, you know, very waspy women that she's going to, and if she could just emulate them and follow in their footsteps, that she would get the same happiness. So I needed her to kind of be um, a little on the inexperienced side and never having met these, these types of people before, and that that would really inform her story as she grew over the summer. But as I was developing the secondary characters, because I knew I wanted my main character to really leave the island with a completely different view of, of class and um, of feminism and, and whatnot. I needed my main characters, my two other women in the story to be archetypes in a sense. Mm -hmm. So Gigi McCabe, who is the very voluptuous, glamorous movie star who's on the island for the summer, really is a feminist. She's a very empowered woman. She's very bold. And she's in my main character, Hetty's ear, encouraging her to really make her own choices and not to look at these very waspy women and think that that's all there is. You know, at one point she says, what do you want to be slow dancing with your vacuum at four o'clock every day? Like what's the, you know, so, so, and then the other main character, Jean Rose, who is the epitome of a, of a you know, waspy matriarch, um, very wealthy, steal money. Um, you know, she's somebody who's trapped, who's very deeply unhappy, who looks gorgeous. Her hair is always done and she's labored over her outfits and she always appears to say the right thing and has the great circle of friends and the right admissions to the right mm -hmm. social clubs. and but she's really deeply unhappy. And she, so, so my character really learns from these two women, but they really became archetypes of, of the types of choices you could make in that time period. Love that. Um, uh, Sarah, how about we go with you? You have so many characters that we see. I mean, I mean, you're in the heads of every single one of these, these members of the family. Um, did you start with one? Did you start with one character or did you always know you were going to do the rotating points of view? Did you know that you were going to like, or I'm, I'm just interested to know like who kind of came first, if anyone. Well, um, I sort of, I started in, in 59. I was really, what began it was um, the, I knew that I wanted to have a love affair that was a secret between uh, one of the Milton girls and a Jewish man and, and in 1959 because I really wanted to think about the anti-Semitism of um, this kind of family, certainly the anti-Semitism I had grown up with, the kind of sense of like, that's just how it is, that's just how it was, the notion of how you don't see what you are um, in the middle of. And um, I was also interested in um, the third generation and the relationship, like what she didn't know about her mother. Um, so the sort of back and forth there. So in many ways, it started with Joan Milton, who is, who is at the center. Um, and uh, so what a, a chapter that's now somewhere in, like in the latter third of the novel is, uh, was the very first thing I wrote where she's standing, um, it's really hot and she's looking, um, she's standing sort of at the top of the stairs in the old Penn Station, not the Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Station we have now, um, much grander, much more like Grand Central and, and just sees a man crossing in a seersucker suit and um, then it goes from there. And um, so I, my characters always, I, I, I never really know who they are. I just sort of follow them. But I knew that that was the sort of central situation. And then Evie, the third generation, um, she, the kind of dialogue that goes between them seem to seem um, in terms of time period, that's where I started. But Kitty, who's the matriarch, who, who is the person who does the kind of monstrous thing was the most, she's the character that was the most, um, I mean, I love hearing what you're saying, Brooke, about archetypes, because in fact, I needed to make sure she wasn't the wasp archetype so that we, um, because I wanted the cracks to show. So that it's so interesting what you're describing, like how we use what we all have agreed on is the, you know, stands in for, is the frame for these people. And, you know, so um, troubling that archetype was really a challenge, but also it, for my pur purposes, because I didn't want her to be dismissible um, because of what she does. Um, it was, it was like, that was my um, sort of writer um, angst about like how to, how to both show it and 
and um, and sort of crater it in the same moment, if you know what I mean. No, I do. I do because you have to. I understand what you're saying of of taking that and you know making sure that that she was sympathetic enough, but she also still has to embody that sort of that regalness and that this is my world and that kind of commanding thing yeah. that enables her to pull the rest of the, you know, to shape the rest of the family's history so substantially. You and know? to really do something awful. Right. And yeah. not to let, and there's no, you know, not to let it, her off the hook. Yeah. yeah. So great. And Susie, I mean, Vivi and Maxine, like you have these two amazing, we're like just the descriptions of like, okay, so now we've got Sigurdice Swimmer who like, you know, Hollywood glam actress, and we've got the wannabe journalist. And it just like sounds like, you know, the perfect, like, I can't wait for this to be made into a movie. And I'm like already thinking of who I want cast in yeah. that, like, <laughs> and I'm like, I wish it were me. Both. <laughs> <But> <laughs> But uh, can you talk about how you how you uh, came up with these fantastic characters? Yeah, and thank you. So as I said, Esther Williams was really the inspiration. But what's interesting is that um, this wasn't my first uh, writing attempt for this story. I originally spent a year writing a different story where the Aquacade was a revival in the 50s at Rye Playland, which is a historic pool in Rye, New York. And my main character was a journalist because I was really interested um, pretty much reading about um, Good Girls Revolt and about undercover female journalists because there weren't very many jobs that women could have at the time. And why am I blanking on the woman who was who went into the um, into the insane asyl asylum and also took the trip around the world? Help me out here, somebody. Anyway, that journalist, I was fascinated with her story. Um, um, 21 Days in a Madhouse or something. I have the book somewhere, but anyway, somebody will write it in the thing. Um, yeah, if anybody but, knows, please write it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I'll look it up after I finish. <laughs> so, um, so originally I was writing about that story and then that story just didn't end up working. That's a very long story, but then I decided- Nellie Bly. Sorry. Yeah, Nellie Bly, thank you. In fact, my, my main character in my last, thank you, Fran, my main character in, in the novel that isn't ever going to see the light of day was named Nell after Nellie Bly, and she becomes an undercover journalist um, exposing graft that was taking place at this revival of the Aquacade at Rye Playland. So there's a lot going on there, but basically when that um, book ended up not happening. I had to reapproach the entire thing and decided, okay, well, I love the Aquacade and I love the World's Fair. Why don't I just put the book there? So then my main character became Vivi. And when I needed to bring in another character, I, I really didn't want to lose my journalist character um, because a journalist plays so many roles, right? I mean, a journalist exposes what it was like for women in journalism at the time and also has a way of, of telling us what's going on in the world by nature of her job. So I wanted that inside person and thought that the two of them, I really needed to show um, the what two different women could, how two different women at the same time could embody two different approaches to life. And so I wanted to pit them against each other, um, have them join, have them separate, and then hopefully, you know, come back together at the end. So that's how those characters came about. So great. Thank you. Now, obviously, I'm listening to you talk about your research. And guys, full disclosure, I totally cheated because Susie and I chatted earlier this week on A Mighty Blaze. Um, so I, I, I designed this question. It, I mean, I, this is a very obvious question, but uh, your research was so cool. And I have to ask you all about your research process a little bit and how you went about it. Um, and I'd love to know, uh, you know, what resources you found most helpful, how you started to tackle this you know, this incredible, because it's so much work. In addition, like, not only do you have to write a novel, which is really, really hard to write a story, but you also have to do all of this research that relates to, I have to make this historically accurate. I have to put in references that make sense. I have to, you know, even design my characters in a way that makes sense for the era and all of these things. Um, and I'd love to know if there's anything really cool that stuck out uh, to you, like one really cool tidbit or fact or object or um, thing that you found in the past. And we'll start with you, Sarah, because I like I'm literally having a panic attack ima imagining how much research you had to do for your book. 
Oh, well, you know, first and, and foremost, it, I should just point out that both and the, the Postmistress, which I wrote, uh, which was my second novel, um, took 10 years. This one took eight. So just in terms of research, and Susie used the word rabbit hole earlier, very early on, <laughs> it's like, that is the great seductive danger of, I, th I think, of writing historical fiction. I don't know if you guys feel like that, um, all three of you, because that's what you're writing. But, you know, there's just so much good stuff that, you know, <laughs> it's in there. And like, you know, Susie's thing of like having written an entire novel for a year, that's like where she's gone down that way. And then she realizes, oh no, that's not the story. And you have to walk your way back. And I think um, that's, the, that's the great thing about research. Uh, my research is always um, in the, when I'm writing, I only am reading things that are written of that time, unless it's, you know, history about it. So, because I really want to get the cadences um, of, you know, of the sentences, the way people, the dialogue, way people are speaking in my head. So, you know, for the time that I'm reading, uh, writing, it'll be, you know, I'll be like an expert on the 30s or the 50s or, you know, um, in The Postmistress, it was 1940, 41. And my first novel was a Victorian novel. So that a lot. Of, and then also, obviously, all the kind of as much journalism from the time, again, because of the diction and because of the cadences. But also because I think, I mean, I'm sure Susie and Brooke, you would um, speak to this too, but it's like how to get inside the brains of characters who wouldn't, ha who don't see past what they can know. That's the really hard part. It's like, so to, again, to make a, a character that we want to, to, for our purposes, but they can't, I mean, like for me, the, the biggest failed historical fiction is where it's so clear that it's just, you know, the present dressed up in crinolines or the present dressed up in hoop skirts or whatever it is. And it's, it's you know, because it has to breathe. That's part of the, the joy for me, certainly, the joy of trying to show the through lines between past and present. And the through lines are being human. So what is it, what would you be? What are your human, who are you in that moment? And what does that tell us about our own? So. Mm -hmm. mm. That is so good, Sarah. Yeah, that's yeah. So good. We're yeah. gonna jump on that in a second because I'm gonna extend <laughs> your answer and bring something. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment because I, I, this it's a very, very, very important point. Um, and Brooke, uh, how about you? What was your research process like? Anything really cool that you discovered? Anything like I obviously mean, you had yeah. source material? Your yeah. your work is vineyard. The '50s and '60s are just ripe with entertaining little tidbits. I mean, you know, just the way. Triscuits were used and jello mold, the food. I mean, it's the food alone can get you, put you down a rabbit hole. Um, so, you know, I did all the things Sarah's just, you know, talking about. I watched the movies. I was reading New York articles from the time. I was um, reading books from the time, you know, watching The Talented Mr. Ripley for the 100th time because I just love that era. Yeah. Um, going to the Brooklyn Flea and looking at costume jewelry from that time. Going on Etsy, looking at the clothes that are, you know, the going through fashion, mag you know, magazine pictures from that day, looking at some of the ridiculous ads that came out. Um, so I did all those things. I think one of the, you know, things for me, because I've been a journalist for over 20 years, was the fear of, you know, it's really tricky with historical fiction, because like, like Sarah was saying, there's the idea that we have of a place, and then there's the idea of what it was back in the year you're writing about it. And I talked to old timers who lived on Martha's Vineyard and, uh, you know, for this book somewhat. And I did tons of research with the Vineyard, you know, reading old articles in the local newspapers there, the MB Times and the Vineyard Gazette. But I feel like it was just, people have real ownership over beach towns and they really feel, I mean, I know my mom even does it with Montauk and it's just this idea of this is not our Martha's Vineyard. You know, this is not the Martha's Vineyard I know. And I really struggled with that in writing this book and studying it in Martha's Vineyard because I knew that no matter what I wrote, no one was going to believe, you know, people just have their own ideas because we're so close to these beach towns that we all write about in these beach reads. And whether it's Provincetown or Rehoboth Beach, wherever it is we're writing about, people really get upset you know their, their feathers get ruffled if it's not the place they know so I had to walk a really fine line between making imagining my version of Martha's Vineyard in 1962 and and what was really there so there are a lot of 
restaurants that I invented. And there's a lot of, um, you know, the beaches are there, obviously. The towns are there. There's uh, the original grocery store is in my book. And, but, you know, you're really, truly playing with setting. And it's a little tricky when you're writing historical fiction, I think. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And it's the same thing, you know, Sarah, the, the fact that there's a private island in Maine that's owned in, in this family. I mean, we, we don't really live in the, the world of private islands necessarily anymore. Of course we do. There are some people that do, but that was not entirely commonplace. I know on the Cape, we have the Elizabethan Islands and there's, um, you know, there's Nashon Island, which is owned by the Forbes family. And like, there's so many, uh, there's a great book called um, the, the Big House, um, that's a, an account of, uh, it's a story of um, a house on Wing's Neck in Cape Cod that uh, it's, you know, which is also related to the Forbes family. It's a nonfiction book, but it's, you know, the chronicle of that crumbling family. I thought of your book, so, of that book so much as I was reading yours about that change and that shift. And you're right, that ownership of the coastal towns and everything, it changes over, over time. Um, it really, and it's impossible for us to really understand that as standing here you know, in the present, but that's, it's such a good point. I'm so glad you brought that up, <laughs> Brooke. Thank you. And Susie, I know your research, like you have like, like so many objects and you have like evidence, you have like collected things. And can you share a little bit about some of the fun things about your research and what you discovered? And again, I, one of the, the um, I know it was the Esther Williams book that first inspired you. Um, and if you could hold that up one more time, because I think one of our readers wanted just a reminder of what that book was, The Million, the million Dollar Mermaid. Mermaid. Um, yeah, I, uh, I did, it's by Esther Williams, but with Davey Deal. Anyway, um, you know, it's interesting because you had said, you know, all that research that you have to do and all that. And to me, that's my favorite part. I'm such a curious person and I love doing the research. And I wish, I kind of wish I could be hired out as a research assistant because I think that that might be the right job for me. Um, but I, yes, I did the same sort of research as everybody with the newspapers and um, the New York Public Library has an unbelievably robust archive of World's Fair photographs. There's also a lot of um, videos. A man named Philip Medicus did an entire, uh, I think it's 16 different videos and they're all up on YouTube. So there's so many things that I got to watch. Um, but as you said, I did go a little nuts on eBay and bought a ton of actual historical things, including today at the fair. So to, to answer both of your questions at once, what's something really cool that I found out? Well, when I found out that there was an actual newspaper that was printed every day at the fair, it was sold on the grounds for five cents. It was an eight page tabloid size newspaper. I just, it, it cemented why my character Max could have worked at a newspaper that summer at the fair. There actually was one. And so I spent so much time pouring through, I actually have two copies, but there's this website called 1939nyworldsfair.com that is so robust and so comprehensive about all of the aspects of the fair. And they have scanned in, um, I think it's about 20 different copies of the World's Fair newspaper. And to just read, and, and as Sarah was saying, the cadence and the diction and just reading how these articles were written, the voice they were written in, and I replicate, I actually have um, one article that I use from the Fair newspaper, but then I write several other in that voice. Um, and it was a very old timey, campy voice in the 1939 fairgrounds you know you think about the setting as well so I, there's just my favorite part of the research though was actually going to the grounds of the 1939 40 fair which is also the grounds of the 1964 1965 world's fair at flushing meadows corona park queens and um walking so, so the, the 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 grounds are the same the pathways that the characters would have walked and to be able to walk those pathways um just felt like my book was coming to life. So that was really, really cool. That's so great. Yeah. So great. Um, I want to go back to Sarah, something Sarah said in, the, in her answer to this last question. Um, and it, we are living in this time of social reckoning right now. And, uh, and I know we're here talking about fun books and summer books and things, but there is heft and weight to each one of your books. And clearly you've thought a lot about, um, social justice issues, your characters run up against a lot of the isms that we are dealing with right now. And, you know, really, really having to face as a society, racism, sexism, um, elitism, classism, all of these things, anti-Semitism, religious persecution, um, your characters 
go through this. They experience this. Um, do you hope, I guess, how, or how do you hope that look examining the past will help us maybe change for the better in the future? Is that something you kind of consciously think about as you write? Is that something that just sort of naturally happens? Um, and, you know, what, yes, I, I'm going to actually not, not go any further. I'm just going to let you guys talk on that. Sarah, do you want to start us off since you? Sure. Since <laughs> sure. I mean, um, I, I think that one of the, well, I'll just start by saying that, um, you know, one of the epigraphs for the guest book is Baldwin's phrase, people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. And, um, you know, as I was starting to write this book, I really wanted to think about that, like take that literally, what's the trap? What's history's trap? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to have it inside us? And especially what does it mean as Americans, white Americans, what is it that, um, you know, what's there and what's partially there and, and what do we um, look at? And I think one of, you know, you use the word reckoning. I think that um, the, the sense of what I, wanted to think about this book doing was showing um, a family not seeing it's the way in which tr history was trapped in them, mm -hmm. but showing how, like the mechanisms of how we pass on what we don't, you know, how we repeat because we don't know, how we choose not to know. So using a family saga to really think about the ways in which racism and anti-Semitism, um, you know, continue the Faulkner cherry about um, the past isn't dead in this country, it isn't even past. Why not? What keeps the past present? So I really was thinking about how, in this case, you know, a, a sort of wasp white family, how it keeps the structures um, going and with that, you know, unwittingly. And, and so, you know, for me, always the sense has been about through lines. Um, and I mean, I, I, that's what Susie and, and Brooke are saying too, like looking at the people that we don't usually see, but the through lines of like, Women have always been who we are, but the, you know, the, the sort of cage dropped down on them defines them, you know, as this archetype, that, that archetype. But, you know, we're writing to show, to break that, you know, free to, to, to try and come out of, of that trap. So I think history, using history to be a way not only to confront it, it's not just examining it, but confronting it. That means thinking of ourselves in the present. Who would we have been then? Yeah. Would we have been, you know, which, which character would we have been? And if we can be honest about that, then asking who are we now? What, you know, showing the through lines. I mean, I feel like historical fiction can be the sneakiest yeah. <laughs> fiction that there is. Again, you know, it's not crinolines. It is often asking us to, you know, make the connection. Agreed. Agreed. I and I, I can't help but think that Susie and um, Brooke, both of your protagonists, you know, all of them, really are people who are pushing the envelope forward. They're trying to move history forward. Um, they're, you know, they're sort of ahead of their time a little bit. So maybe you can comment on that as you, as you think about your answer. Um, Susie, do you want to, do you want to add anything to this? Uh, like, is this some, is that something you thought about of like, yeah, I want yeah. somebody who's driving, who's driving change? Yeah, I think w my personal fault is that I assume that women who are older now or women who aren't even alive now, that when they were younger during this time period, that they didn't have the same feelings and aspirations and ambitions that I did. And that is just so blatantly wrong. And it's my learning about these women and reading their stories that has opened my eyes. And I think we take those women for granted. Um, they wanted the exact same things that we wanted, but they were told, most of them, that they weren't allowed to want them. And there were no structures in place in our society to allow them to explore that. I mean, you think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and what she had to go up against um, physically, you know, the actual things blocking her way and emotionally and 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 to be who she is. and. There were so many women who had the same ambitions as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but the forces telling them that they could not or should not do those things were so strong yeah. that to go against them, there needed to be a perfect storm, I think, of other influences of your family and where you grew up and how you grew up. And, and it's just so interesting. And so it, it was a challenge for me. And I had to break down a lot of my own assumptions and, and, and my, my own discriminations about women 
Um, and so it was fun to kind of give my historical women some ownership and, and to be able to show them, to expose that they are just, we're just like us. Yeah. And also what you have to remember is that my two main characters are one is 19 or 20, yeah. the other is young 20s. And so they were allowed to work then. They hadn't yet gotten to the point where they're supposed to be wives and mothers. Right. Um, so they still had that little window of, of being able to try to butt up against the structures that were put in front of them. And there's something to be said for youth doing that anyways. I mean, we're seeing right now that, that change is being led by, by young voices. Um, and Brooke, clearly you also have a young female character who, you know, is in a different position than she's at, she's going to college. She's in a completely different position from the generation before her where that wasn't, you know, necessarily common practice. Um, is that something you thought about of, of showing those changes? And uh, Yeah, I mean, I think what's so fun about writing historical fiction is that you get to give these characters the ending that you wish all women had back then, right? So you get you get to empower them. You single-handedly empower them right on that page. And I think that when I was writing this book, my first draft, and I went through so many drafts. So if anyone who is watching is a writer, an aspiring writer who wants to get published, just, you know, thousands of drafts of this book. Um, and it changed so many times. The dialogue changed so many times. What I was doing with the characters changed. But in the ending changed because when I wrote the ending, the ending was the same, but it was through the lens, and I'm not going to say what the um, ending is exactly, but it was written through the lens of the her being swept away by the male character. And I remember one of my friends reading it, and she was saying, you know, I wish there was a little more. That's such a strong women's empowerment story. And then the end, it's like, what, what happens here? And I sat back and I thought, wow, here I am feeding the same story we've all been fed. A thousand times, right? You need a man to take you away from it all. And I thought to myself, no, no, she's in charge. She's taking control. She's figuring out what happens when she leaves the island. And that's exactly how the story ends. And I think with historical fiction, when you get to play like that, it's really powerful because you can sort of rewrite history in the tiniest sense, right? With your one character. And it's just great fun, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's so much fun. Oh, that's so great. This is this is such a great conversation. We're we're slowly running, I mean, quickly running out of time here. Um, and I would literally keep going all day if we didn't have the <laughs> other panels today. And I hope you'll all chat with me again in the future. Um, I do want to get to just one or two of the um of the the viewer questions, and I have a little fun question for you all at the end. Um, I had intended to do more fun questions about summer and things, but we got on this such an interesting talk. So I hope everyone was, was as interested and riveted as I was by everything you, you wise, wonderful women had to say. Um, one of our, our questions asked, uh, how do you decide to write on the time period and topic that you choose? We did cover that at the beginning. So if you missed this, we are doing, we are gonna be um, rebroadcasting this on a Mighty Blazes Facebook page. So you can see the answer um, in the first couple minutes of our discussion. Um, but I'm gonna move on to this question um, from Gayla which is, do you choose your books or do they choose you? And what is it that makes either one of those happen? Yeah. And I know you all kind of alluded to this, but maybe a quick, like, like you know, sentence or two about, um, about that. How about Susie? We'll start with you, because I know, again, it was the autobiography, but. Yeah, no, but, but I've read a lot of autobiographies and I read a lot of history and I listen, you know, it was the NPR story on the subway, on the Miss Subway's contest that drew me to the Subway Girls. And it was this Esther Williams book that drew me to this story. But I have a million ideas for a book. So it's really a combination of these ideas come to me, but I actively, you know, choose them of what resonates with me. And that's what I think is somewhat dangerous is the wrong word, but in using our, our books to inform and to teach in that we all have our own biases too, when it comes to the topics we choose, the type of characters we write, what choices our characters have and what choices we allow them to make. So, um, so yeah, it's a combination of, but yeah, I actively choose what, and also you have to think as you're writing a book, what do you want to spend the next however many years on writing and then talking about forever and ever and ever. So there's been a lot of book ideas that I've had that I just really thought were fascinating, like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, but mm -hmm. I didn't want to live with that for years and years talking about that 
So um, I think it's a combination to answer her question. Cool. Uh, Sarah, how about you? I would just completely say ditto, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I um I get I it's it's usually characters doing something that I want to know more about that I that I follow and then the time period kind of I mean everything sort of starts from them so I feel called to some kind of situation within the larger idea of like oh I'd like to write a big family novel and I'd like it to deal with race and class but right that's what's that who knows so you know like usually it's it's somebody calls me Cool. Yeah, I That'd would agree rough. with that. I think you get called and then you get bugged and bugged and bugged because yeah. I sound crazy whenever I talk like this, but you start to hear their voices, right? You can hear their conversations. You see them walk by you on the beach. They're just everywhere. And if you don't write it, if you don't get it out on paper, they're not going to leave you alone. No, very true. Uh, right? They right. just become, they're everywhere. So, so getting it out just felt so good, you know? And I'm just like you, Sarah. I know Susie's completely opposite, but I am very much a panther. And I love to just follow these characters. And I love to see where they take me and how the story unfolds. I always know, with because I just finished my second book, I always know where they're going to end up. So I'm writing towards something. I'm not writing open-ended completely, but I don't have everything laid out. I just kind of love following them for a little while. That's what I do too. Sorry to like oh, interject here, but I do that. I just do it before I start the writing. So mm -hmm. I do let them, t it's uh -huh. kind of like, it's kind of like when people are pregnant and they, they okay to find the gender of the baby when the baby's born, but they don't want to find the, you eventually find out the gender. So I'm just doing it in a different way. You're doing it on paper with your imagination. For yeah. And I'm spending more time figuring that out. And then the writing takes such a, but I'm doing it. It's just ahead of the writing. Do you know what I mean? It's, we, yeah. it's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah. The magic Susie, process Susie changes. Said that she wrote, she writes her book in two weeks. So when she told me that it just blew my mind, I'm so amazed by her. It, that's but a really ugly. Do all the other stuff first. I get it. I just it's an it. ugly first draft. It's an ugly first draft. But yes, I I I can get that out. I have to. I can't let it sit. I know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. Like uh, that could be a whole discussion. Like we need to talk. No, about it really could. Like, we, need to talk <laughs> we need to talk. That's going to be a discussion in the future. We're going to come back and have that talk. Um, real quick, I'm going to do two fun ones. Uh, this one's from Mindy. Uh, what are you reading right now? Or what's one thing you're reading right now or, or looking forward to reading? Because I know so many of you are doing so many tours and things like that, that like you, you are not, but what's one fun thing you're either reading or looking forward to reading? Susie, you, okay. you so I'm, I'm, I saw, I saw. I'm reading um, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, which okay. I highly recommend to everybody. And I just finished Untamed by, by Glennon Doyle, which I listened to and loved, 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 and also highly recommend. Fabulous. Sarah, what are, what's one thing you're reading or looking forward to reading? I'm deep in the middle of the 16th century with Hilary Mantel. I'm reading The Mirror and the Light, wow. and you know, I mean, she's just, I she's bow wonderful. down every day. <laughs> She's amazing. Brooke, how about you? One thing you're reading? Or uh, well, if I can't be in Martha's Vineyard this summer, I might as well be in Nantucket. So I'm reading 28 Summers by Ellen Hildebrand. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, I, would... and I will do anything to get back to one of those islands. <laughs> I'm going to be reading that in just a moment as well. I talked to Ellen the other day and I was like, I haven't read your book yet. And I literally like always, I, I, I usually wait until I go to Nantucket to read her book and that I'm not going this year. So it's going to be at my own house or, my, but that's okay too. That's not, not a hardship. He whisks you right there. So what does yeah, it matter? Exactly. <laughs> um, and here's, if you could pick one year or you can say a decade or something uh, to experience a summer, what would you pick? Like when, what, where would you go back in history to live out a summer if you could? And let's start with you, Brooke. Um, okay, so uh, my next book takes place in 1957 Southampton, out in the Hamptons, and so I'm going to say that because it's Hamptons Bohemia. It's when the artists are out there, Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock, you know, you're out in this scene of writers and artists at the beach, and to me, there couldn't be a better place, and I just have spent time there and just love it. I didn't want to leave it when it was done. Awesome. Uh, Susie, you know, you I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, and... <laughs> I'm not, okay, I'm, I was going to apologize for my answer, but I'm not going to apologize for my answer. I think my answer is not answering your questions, but it's right now, because I think that we're in such a reckoning and such a, a long overdue correction. And I am, it's a, it's in our world. It's also personally, as I turn 50 this summer, like I'm, we're all becoming, to borrow a phrase from Michelle Obama, I'm a, 
want to watch the world becoming. I want to watch myself becoming. So I'm going to say the summer of 2020. Wow. Hmm, I love it. That is like, yeah, that, that's a good answer. <laughs> Sarah, how about you? It's a great answer because actually one of the things that, I mean, is implied in your question yeah. is, you know, what are summers? You know, yeah. like, what are they? And, and especially beach summers are usually, you know, um, uh, retreats or refuges, refu refuges, whatever, <laughs> um, uh, you know, places that you escape, you escape from and and it's it's not insignificant that they're often on islands and you know or places that are removed it's um so i think that that's one kind of summer and that's you know i was if you were going to ask the question about nostalgia i was going to say that's the most dangerous kind of summer that's yeah. the most dangerous kind i mean speak, picking up what susie's saying so the thing that i think is so interesting right now you know of the summer of 2020 because i would also say like I don't want to go. I mean, I would love to get, I'd love to go somewhere except for my house, but, is, <laughs> but, but the, the sense of departing where we have been um, and, you know, really seeing, I mean, I live in Washington, DC, so it's just right. I'm, you know, surrounded by it the minute I walk out the door. So it's a great way to think about what summers are and can be like what, how you pull yourself out. But often when you pull yourself out, you see most clearly. So I think that's why there's so much of, you know, the, the longing for summers, because somehow you returned to something you didn't see before. And, you know, what's, what's kind of wild about right now is that we're all doing it in place. Yeah, we are. Wow. And here I am, like, I'd go to Newport in the 1920s. <laughs> <I'm> like... <laughs> I'm good too. That's nothing. You can have an and. What I've learned yeah. <laughs> and I also love to go to one of those those you parties. Can, right. and, you can you know, I'm, I, I agree. That's it. I think that's exactly right. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the power of it. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Any last things you'd like to say? Um, shout out if you want to tell us what you're working on next, or um, if you have an event that you want to talk about, or a reminder. And I do want to remind everybody. Um, first and foremost, to please go out and buy their books. Sarah Blake's book is the guest book. Um, it's out in pa paperback now. Brooklyn Foster's is Summer Darlings. That's out in hardcover now. Susie Orman Sch Schnalls is We Came Here to Shine. That is out now. Um, we would love you to buy their books and support. And if please, um, oh, I know what I uh, what I forgot. What I always oh, do sure. is um, <laughs> at an independent bookstore because we would love you to buy them from an independent bookstore. So little shout out to an independent bookstore you might want yes, to? Um, I'll shout out to a bunch of grapes on Martha's Vineyard, one of my favorite bookstores in the country. Great. I'll shout out to the Lit Bar, which is the only bookstore in the Bronx, and it's owned by a Black woman, and her storefront is on bookshop.org. Awesome. And I'll shout out to Politics and Prose right here in Washington. Oh, I love Politics and Fabulous. Thank you all so much. This Thank was you. absolutely incredible. Thank you. This was so Thank much fun. You. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, thank you to Jen Intwistle um, and the Newburyport Literary Festival. Thank you to Jenna Blum and Caroline Levitt and Amity Blaze and all of the rest of our team there. Um, thank you to Leslie Hendrickson, who is actually running all of the, the tech stuff behind the scenes and you can't see her, but thank you. Um, and thank you guys. We'll be, we'll be on in a few minutes with our, our next panel, which is Summer Lovin' at 11.15. If